Okay, I think we're good to go. According to my clock, it's 1300 universal time. So welcome to everybody from um, around the world. Um, um, my name is Adam Deato. I'll be the host for today. Um, and this is our first, um, first live event for uh, Cumulus Connects, a new initiative that the Cumulus Association have um, been working on for the past number of months. Um, our hope is that this format will work reasonably well. We chose, chose a, a Zoom call, a normal Zoom call with all of, all of you as the audience and our panel um, in, uh, in favor of a, a webinar because we felt it might allow us to see each other and uh, allow the audience more of an opportunity to participate meaningfully. Um, so um, we'll, we'll go ahead with some introductions if that's okay. Um, those of you who are not um, on the panel, you might um, of course just check that your mics are uh, switched off um, and you might also just check that um, that you're on speaker view so as you can see the speakers um, as they speak okay um, the um, the first person I'd like to introduce is our president Mariana Amatuyo who is uh, joining us from Parsons in New York or is joining us from New York at least <laughs> she's not in Parsons uh, so welcome Mariana um, I'd also like to welcome Mary Mullen uh, Mary B Mullen uh, joining us from uh, Poole in Dorset um, Ashok Chatterjee joining us from Ahmedabad in India. Um, Roberto uh, Flores from uh, Monterey Tech in Mexico. And Dory Tunstall joining us from OCAD University in, um, in Canada. So very welcome to, to all of our esteemed panelists. And um, we'll, as I say, the format uh, for today is that we'll, we'll spend about a half hour doing some uh, general discussion uh, based on some of the questions that have come from the audience in advance and then at half past the hour we would move to an open questions and answers um, with the panel and with each other for about 20 minutes and then a 10 minute wrap up at the end. Okay so without further ado I'll, I'll start the questions if that's okay and my, my first question I think is, is addressed at um, uh, at Mariana, if that's okay. Um, so Mariana, how, um, how do you think the models of design education and research need to change effectively um, to respond to the um, challenges of the current pa pandemic? So thank you and uh, uh, it is wonderful to be joining you all and as Cumulus President, I do want to say thank you to my colleagues uh, in the editorial team um, and uh, the Secretariat and everyone who has made the Cumulus Connects site possible and this conversation be the first one uh, of many that we look forward to hosting. It's been um, a real effort for, for our association, very much responding to um, the question you're posing, Adam. So again, my, my kudos and, and gratitude to Philip. Um, uh, Anna from the Secretariat and, and many of you on this call in our editorial team and of course our moderator. Um, I would start, you know, I, I, being based in New York City these days, it's um, and being September 11, 19 years since the September 11 terrorist attacks, I think it is important to start with a reflection about the significance of that event and the parallels perhaps we could see uh, with this question of long-term change that the pandemic might bring. Of course, once one, one event um, was a terrorist attack. We are living now a public health crisis, an economic crisis, a societal crisis that is playing out in questions, of course, of inequity and race and, uh, and violence. So this is a multiplicity of crisis compared to the September 11 one. But a key parallel to me is connected to questions of long-term norms and behavior change. September 11 brought about a huge uh, sort of novel event that changed forever how we perceive international travel, how we behave in our airports, and our perception of safety and security. And I think with, uh, with COVID-19, we're starting to 
only grapple from a perspective of design and art education to the and higher education at large to the long term long term changes we might see coming coming our way um, and I don't believe we have a full uh, sort of understanding of what that might look like. This is such an un unprecedented event. There are no playbooks to compare it to really other than the 1918 uh, uh, flu pandemic and, and that of course it was a very different time in the world. And so um, I, I do believe it, it's, 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 we only have signals to, to answer the question, right? Um, and the signals to me are in a number of areas as a, as a design uh, educator, but also as an administrator in my university, the new school and Parsons. I've had the great uh, privilege to work with many of my colleagues in the whole shift to online education and remote instruction that we've done, all of us had had to do in our institutions around the world. And it's been very exciting to see the innovation that has occurred um, for many of our disciplines where we didn't think we would ever, you know, move to an online environment. Uh, or, and we had to do it, we had no, no option. And that has um, allowed us to, I think, gain a new confidence about what is actually possible in the, in the delivery. Of, of online, even for disciplines like many of our disciplines um, that really need face-to-face -face instruction, they need the making centers, they need, um, you know, they need that personal engagement. And of course, we're not able to replicate that, but I think we are learning that um, there's a lot, very engaged sort of pedagogy that can actually occur. Uh, in this environment. I'm going to stop there because I could go on and on, but frankly, my message is to say that there is a silver lining and that there is a lot of innovation that we are seeing and that um, we only have signals of the changes that are to be, that I believe are to come and, and will be here to stay even when we have the vaccine and, and get over this, this ter terrible crisis. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you very much. Um, my, my next question, I suppose, is uh, we, we can come back to the theme, um, of course, as, as the conversation goes on. But my next question is, is directed at Roberto, if that's OK. Um, uh, Roberto, can you um, maybe give your perspective on, on how you think we can better prepare design students and researchers to be active participants and maybe leaders and innovators in a post-pandemic um, uh, world, I suppose. Uh, thank you, Adam. Well, first of all, I would like to thank Cumulus and Mariana, well, Adam and all the staff for organizing these uh, uh, valuable meetings. And, um, and well, yeah, re regards, uh, as, as Mariana was already mentioning, the, uh, we, we are all universities still on the transit and the re reflection on how to, React in these unprecedented times, um, and uh, but I, I I think that is it is very important that uh, universities be ourselves as actors of the territory more and more, and so I think that this idea of the third mission of the universities, I mean, together with education and knowledge creation activities that are the, the first two, uh, having a positive impact is very relevant. Uh, so we could be as universities a op open platform that connects with territorial ecosystems and catalyze change. And, and well, e each university has its own ways of doing it. Uh, at least in Mexico at Tec de Monterrey, we do it with entrepreneurship. Um, entrepreneurship is the, the vehicle that connects education, research, and try to create that positive change for our communities. Um, and entrepreneurship not only understood as the creation of new businesses, but more like as, as a, competence, a competence to lead new initiatives, uh, which must be sustainable over time, of course. So uh, I, uh, I think that this is a, 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 a great moment to reflect on that. 
how as universities we could be more and more uh, co connected with the territories and the ecosystem in order to, 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 to create a positive impact. Thank you. Great, Roberto, gracias. Um, uh, Dori, if I might come to you next. Um, we, we were discussing uh, recently um, amongst ourselves, you know, the, the idea of, I suppose, what we're, we're terming global society or, you know, global, global thinking and local, um, locally appropriate or locally specific um, responses. Um, is there, is there um, maybe something that you can share from your own experience um, that you see are the big issues for, for that type of thinking where we're, we're trying to educate uh, the future designers perhaps about being global citizens, but also being locally appropriate um, leaders, change makers, actors, whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think one of the advantages of living in Toronto is that it's a local city. I mean, it's a city that is made up of many, um, well, strong indigenous presence. And so we have like um, Six Nations uh, res uh, Reserve just right outside of Toronto. So we have that very local perspective going back thousands and thousands of years, which we're trying to incorporate in design through kind of this process of decolonization. But at the same time, you know, Toronto is a very international city. You have people from all over the world. It's a city that's what's called minority majority. So we have a majority of people um, are in many ways first or second generation um, from uh, Asia, South Asia, uh, uh, Chile, Mexico, Vietnam, from all over the world. So even within our student population, um, we have to deal both what's locally the context of being in Toronto and being on indigenous lands, um, particularly the lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huon Wendat. Um, but we're also global. And so what we are able to do in our curriculum, in our community in and of itself is actually reflect that it's not even a balance is the right word. It's that dialogue between what it is that you're doing that affects me where I am, but also has uh, reverberations from all over the world. And so in our graphic design courses, for example, you know, we, uh, the students engage with using multiple language. They may use their, you know, their parents or their grandparents' language in design, as well as how does that mix, uh, you know, with English and French and even in some of the ways like in Cree, right? Um, so really um, the lucky thing about being in Toronto is that we exist at a point of locality um, where we have to deal with both the local and the international um, as being the um, unique dynamic of our local context in and of itself. Super. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dory. That's, that's really, really interesting. Um, I, I'll come to Ashok next, if that's okay. Um, uh, Ashok, uh, you have, I think, probably the most experience of, of most of us um, uh, over, over many years of advocacy in, in design education and in design, um, not just in India. Um, I know in Ireland also. Um, from many years ago. So my, my question, I suppose, to you um, is um, what, what learnings do you feel um, we can take from, from past experiences um, with respect to design advocacy um, and supporting design education or maybe changing design education or, or as we've discussed before, changing education um, in, in the more holistic sense? Thank you, Adam, and thanks to Cumulus for this opportunity. Actually, I'm a bit at a disadvantage because it's been many years since I actually was in a design classroom, but uh, I'm surrounded by the challenges that design education has had. And in this pandemic, particularly in what the pandemic has told us here in India about our society, one of the things that has 
come through, which is, I think, rather uh, critical from my perspective, is to whether we can use this opportunity when we don't really know when this pandemic will end, when we don't really know what other crises will follow it, whether we can address some of the uh, basic issues about education, not just the pedagogy of teaching design in a new way, but perhaps uh, re-articulating to our societies why design is important. I think one of the real lessons of this pandemic in India has been, and it's for unfolding right around us as I speak. I've just received before we got online word that in one of our most craft rich states, suicides have started amongst some of our greatest artisans. And this sense that after all these years, our design education continues to concentrate, to focus on what in this country is called the organized sector. In other words, on corporates. Whereas the pandemic has revealed what we've known all along, but have ignored, that the vast majority of livelihoods in this country are in the so-called informal sector, which is outside the reach of the design of design service. And we started design education in India with the hope and with the aspiration that design education that we started in the 60s and the 70s would in fact uplift the majority of our people. And in 2020, we realized that the majority of our people are still outside the reach of design service and are still visited by design education, but not served by design education, if you understand what I mean. So it does seem to me that one of the most important things that we need to do now is to go back to the fundamentals and ask ourselves, what kind of a world is design education supposed to be geared for, aimed at, targeted to? And perhaps we can start with the Sustainable Development Goals and look at those and ask ourselves that in the context of the pandemic, how is design education responding to those Sustainable Development Goals? Uh, which were articulated before anyone had any understanding of what was going to hit us, but now takes on new meaning. For example, goal 12, which is about responsible production and responsible consumption. What do these terms mean? And then what do they mean for design education? And the other thing I would suggest that we in education do is to start talking to industry and ask them where do they think they're going because eventually the kids we educate are going to be looking for jobs. So what are not just the educators, what are the clients saying? And we better begin to understand that so that we can start moving in some kind of uh, in harmony with what industry may be needing and perhaps influence where industry may be going. Thank you, Ashok. Very, very interesting. I'm going to come to Mary next, if that's okay. Um, um, because I think it would be a nice follow on from, from the point that the point that you're raising, um, Ashok. Mary, um, again, you also have a long, long experience in, I suppose, in advocacy for design and in, in that connection between um, education, industry, and um, design in the wider society and how it's understood. Um, is, there, is there a follow-up uh, from, from what Ashok has said that, that you would like to, like to add um, from your perspective? Well, I, I feel a bit of a fraud in the field of design educators. I'm the maverick, but um, it's wonderful and a great honor to be with you all. Um, I couldn't agree more with what Ashok has said and it applies not only to India, but to developed countries or what we consider developed countries as well. From 
my association with universities and colleges and with designers, I think perhaps the most important thing is that we must encourage all you edu educators to find ways to nourish the creative minds and to teach young people who have this great creative ability to look at the problems that you've all highlighted and how that they will be able to um, think ahead, as you've indicated, we all don't know what's going to happen, but somehow to think again and then to ask, why not? Why can't we look at things in a different way and to find new ways of doing it without necessarily abandoning the old? Um, I think we have to go back to basics in a lot. Um, we have to look at things in our world, which are things like sustainability, as, as Ashoka said, but the very methodology in which we deliver health services or education itself uh, might perform or give a lead for how other services are delivered. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much. Um, we, we have a little bit more time uh, before we go to the, the general audience. Um, but So I'd like to just come back around to one, of, one or two of the themes, if that's okay, um, that, that have been raised. Um, that that um, suggestion, because we're so focused, I guess, on, on the pandemic globally at the moment, our, our focus tends to be very, what I would describe as anthropocentric, very human-centric. Um, and I'm just interested, perhaps I could direct this at, again at Mariana, if that's okay. Um, uh, I'm just interested in your take on the relevance to sustainability as we describe it or, or to the natural world and how, uh, how perhaps we can rethink our, our um, approach to learning from the pandemic, rethink our approach to how we influence the natural world um, as, uh, or the non-human part of the world, I suppose. Yeah, thank you for that question. I think it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Just this week, I had the opportunity to attend the Ellen MacArthur Summit. Um, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation uh, was very involved in, as a knowledge partner for Cumulus in the Cumulus Green competition that we ran for the association this past year that was aligned with SDG 12 and um, responsible production and consumption and it was interesting to hear that this is a 10 year 10 year old effort now the Ellen MacArthur Foundation they started I think with four four industry partners and now there's literally you know thousands of the, the most important corporate partners um, universities foundations etc around the world very connected to this mission of thinking through um, the responsibility we have uh, and, and design is a core element and designers are a big part of this, right? The responsibility of thinking about the built environment and, um, and climate change and issues of sustainability. So these are, I, I think that COVID is showing us the interconnected but also vulnerable nature of uh, this globalized world that we have sort of taken a little bit for granted. Um, uh, I believe that, um, you know, as an international association speaking, as, as, a, cumulus, as a cumulus stakeholder here, um, COVID has um, been a very wake up call for, for many of us, uh, certainly in the board, to think about our footprint, our ecological footprint, some of the assumptions we make when we think about coming together as an international community, what does that mean in terms of the carbon footprint that we are creating? Um, but um, it's also outside, I think, our, our circles, what we are seeing from the research and from the media is a reckoning um, around how this climate crisis that we're in is only going to, to get worse, right? Here again, speaking as someone based in the US, we are um, seeing this apocalyptic 
sort of situation happening in California with, with the wildfires in California, Oregon, and Washington states in the US. Um, and um, it's, it's, I think, you know, the, the data is out there, the science is out there showing us how uh, little we've done to care for this planet and how, again, as human beings, we are, you know, one, one component of, of, a, of a world that, that we have to take much more responsibility for. And as designers and design educators and artists, um, I do believe we have a, a huge responsibility and this has to be at the core of our, of our curricula um, and the sort of global citizenship uh, that we impart to, to our students, wherever they may be. Thank you, Mariana. Um, just to take for, uh, just two more minutes uh, while we um, while we wait, for, we come to the audience questions. I'm going to ask Roberto to respond to the to I suppose to something that Dory raised um, about um, the need to to to. I suppose to rethink um, design education in the in the in the sense of decolonization. Um, uh, if I'm if I'm not summarizing as a phrase, uh, Dory. In in Mexico, how how would you consider this to be relevant or important, or maybe in Latin America in the in the wider context? Because of course, Latin America is another one of the the global regions that has been hugely affected by by colonization in the past and now perhaps the, the the continuation of the effects of that. Thank you Adam. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, I think in Latin America and well here I see some of my Latin American colleagues connected and maybe they can add to the conversation too. Uh, there, there, is, there is a at this moment a very I would say relevant discussion about, about this, the decolonization of, of design in general, because, uh, well, yeah, our, our history of how design get into Latin America is, you know, it is, we inherit models from outside. Uh, and, uh, but now at, at these days, I think that there is also this uh, uh, very, very, uh, globalization movement that that were the were the were at the at the time we are getting more global and connected we are still on that transit on 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 finding our ways i will say to 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 understand and use design and we already have our own on history and how to do it on more mature practices and institutions universities and organizations that had assimilate uh, very very uh, in a very particular local local way so well yeah I will say that that uh, the, it, it has been very interesting during the last I will say 10 years in Latin America how uh, the, the the dialogues I will say are, are getting more and more uh, connected to the local and this 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 idea of, of 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 being in a global world is is in more and more part of our day to day and uh, reflections inside universities and the way we are educating our students are including this also okay gracias uh, gracias roberto encantado um, um, we're just coming up to the half hour, so um, if it's okay, we'll, we'll go to the audience and maybe continue some of the themes that have been raised. 